on my sofa. I've just had a little walk in the garden. I've just finished filming my the rest of my garden video. It's taken me a couple of weeks this time just to pick up little things to talk about. Not much goes on in the garden. Things are just popping through the ground. So that doesn't give you much to film at the moment, but all the leaves are out on the trees now. So I've just had a little walk down a little leafy lane. And now I'm going to finish my cup of tea. That's a good crossover from my garden video. I quite like this, yeah. <laughs> I've just come in from the garden and I'm back on my sofa having a cup of tea that I had back in my garden. Oh, where's me mat? Let's have a look, where's me mat? <sighs> Do you like the jumper? This is one of my favourite jumpers. This pattern is in the Calf Facet Pattern Library. It's the big flower. See? Oh. Yeah, that's Intarsia. And a bit of Fair Isle. So I have done a bit of Intarsia. There's a lot of uh, people doing Intarsia at the moment. I might do some, but simple. I fancied doing a jumper I did years and years ago. Gosh, I must have been in my 20s because I was working in Carlisle at the time. I think I was working in the accountant's office. Probably. But I had a local uh, wool shop on the same little street that there was a little deli where I used to go and get um, smoked salmon. Uh, cream cheese. And Russian salad. And a baguette. Me thinks that is really stretching my memory these days. I have to stretch my memory these days. And across the road from this deli was a little wool shop, just a small one, a wee one. And I went in there and I saw some yarns, and it was kind of a mustardy yellow yarn, quite light mustardy yellow. Oh, I, I can't really sort of describe it. It's not very easy to describe, but it was quite a pale mustardy yellow. That's all I can say. With a lot of grey blues. So things like a grey blue boucle. So I've got a ball of that. A grey blue mohair. So I've got a ball of that. And there was something else, and I just cannot remember what it was. Irritating, isn't it, when you can't remember something? Anyway, so therefore, I made a patch um, jumper. So, perhaps boucle, mohair mustardy yellow and I can't remember what that was so it's a, a four square for the front and all the rest of it was in the mustardy yellow with a crew neck and um, ribbing and of course at the bottom the ribbing sleeves long sleeves with normal ribbing nothing nothing more than that but 
the wool shop must have been that impressed because obviously I used to buy things, I used to put it back, you know, the wool, put the wool back and go into the shop when I could afford to buy another ball of wool. I think a lot of these were wool. <clears throat> so I think the shopkeeper must have been very impressed because she, I took it in to show her what I'd done. And she said, would you like to do some knitting? And I said, oh yeah, I wouldn't mind trying. Well, I get a commission to make a matching christening robe for um, a set of twins. The original christening robe that had been knitted by a relative was still in existence but they needed another one just slightly bigger and i have a slightly loose knit anyway well it was all on two ply with was it number 12s and number 13s but very very fine needles and i had the pattern and it was all in lace work but I actually did it. It took me four, it was supposed to be done in four weeks, but I I asked for an extra week <laughs> and I got an extra week. And the, the mum and dad of the twins came to visit me to pick up the, the christening robe. Well, you know, to be fair, I was extremely worried. I think I can, must have been only in my early 20s when I did that. I didn't consider myself a, an excellent knitter. But they obviously thought I was good. <laughs> or else never have given me the commission. Who would have given a commission like that to a 20 whatever year old who just knitted a block sweater? Anyway, off the top, off the topic again as usual. But that's what I would like to do: recreate the block sweater. I've actually seen it done in cotton on um, the run in the Rowan magazine for I think it was last month, was it? I've already seen that. It's been done by somebody on in the Rowan magazine. But I can say I did that. Ooh, how old am I now? Almost 40 years ago. I'm ahead of my time. <laughs> oh, I think I'll cut that bit out. That just sounds a bit too big headed, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, what am I doing this week? Well, you know that we were looking at my designs last week. I cast on. And I'm now just finishing the sleeve of a t-shirt. Do you like the colour? Now this is called Sulphur Spring and it's one of the woolly knit 100% four ply cotton cones that I bought. Mal said, it's a bit pale, isn't it? And I says, well, I do like pastels. I know I'm a bright, light, bright colours, but I do like pastels. It's a yellowy green, which is quite what I like. And a pastel yellow green, which is what, something I've never really thought about. I like the yellow green in its full glory, bright and fluorescent. But never thought of it in a pastel. So I'm working on it with a pair of number nine, um, number nines. That's what it says on here. But it's a three point seven five mil, which is giving it a very loose fabric, which 
if you were in a hot country, you would very much, very, very much appreciate because this is so light. In fact, it's going to be too cold for me to wear here. It's so light. We only really get spring temperatures during the summer. I think the highest we've been, as I've said before, is about 24 degrees since I've been here. But it's the wind. So I'm on a pearl roll. I've gone back. I've gone straight. Straight needles. For this one. I had promised some time ago to do a little tutorial on sewing a garment together. So when I finish this one, I shall film a little tutorial on how I sew things together. Now I've done a little eclair style um, what do they call them? I cord edge. For a little opening at the front of this t shirt. So I'm just going up the other side now. You can see that the sleeve is all in one. See? Now the bottom is a beautiful, can you see that, lacy edge. That's all I felt it needed. Nothing too much. That beautiful edge there is so easy to do. And then a little flower. I got these little motifs from the Elizabeth Lovick Shetland Lace book that I have. But can you see how light it is? And it's just so lightweight and airy. I suppose, yeah, I mean, I've done it on size, size nine needles, but... Or 3.75 <laughs> mils. And I'm doing it knit to knit and pearl. Like I say, I'm just going up the other side of the neck now. Wait a minute, I don't think I did that right. That's, I've just cut to a couple of rows straight before I start messing around with the eye cord edge. That's what I was going to do. That's what I did on the other side or else it'll not look right. What I also do when knitting straight, on a purl row, I begin the purl row with a knit stitch and end it with a knit stitch because then you get a much neater edging. So now I'm going across now with the knit stitch. I've also found that since I've been using a circular needle, that because I do a lot of knit stitches on that, my tension has been lost on the on the straight needles. So my knit row is pretty good, obviously, because I've been knit, 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 knit. It. But my pearl row has gone a bit looser. Some people would say change the size of your needle for going backwards, but for me, it's a matter of getting back into a rhythm with my knitting. I always know my tension in my knitting because I've done it this way for years. But when you change a style of knitting to a circular needle, then it's, it's going to change, isn't it? It's going to be different.
So I'm coming to the end of my row. And what I've been doing with the sleeve, I cast on some extra stitches using the knit method. Not the thumb net method or wrapping the yarn around your needle. I just knit into the first stitch and cast on a stitch and knit into that cat new cast on stitch and add, and add another stitch, etc. etc. They there are so many different names for these things, I don't know what you call it. I just know that's the way I was taught and that's the way I do it. Right, so I've come to the sleeve edge, which, and I love this. I love this. I did a pair of gloves on the axis. axis. So there's my sleeve edge. It's eight garter stitch stitches little bit of black thread on there and that gives a little bit of stretch but we're knitting in cotton here there is no stretch in cotton <laughs> what I like about wool is is when you knit it it's like it's spring it's springy with cotton there's no spring in it so I'm knitting eight stitches for my sleeve edge, then I'm going back to doing purl for the rest of the row. At the moment, I'm actually knitting off the cone. But if you've seen me in past episodes, I actually wind yarn off onto a well, I can use a yarn winder to um, make little cakes. Then I usually knit them together. Now I've got some copper brown um, cotton. And I'm going to use two strands. Knit two strands together to make a pair of cargo pants or shorts. I'm not going to go as long as a pair of pants. I could do, but I'm not going to. If I feel in the mood, I could make a couple of tubes that you could button on to the bottom of the shorts. Now that would be interesting, wouldn't it? But this... is done in with one strand coming off just one strand so therefore this is a four ply top but it feels like a very light four ply lighter than anything I've used of late but do you know what I am really pleased with it because of the complete floatiness of it. You could imagine a pretty blouse in that, couldn't you? You could imagine a floaty skirt. It's just like a very light fabric. Right, I'm coming to the end of my row now. I started with eight stitches for the garter stitches for the beginning of the row, which is the sleeve end. And at the neck edge, I'm just going to purl to the end and then knit the last stitch. It just keeps it more stable. It does. Love it. When you actually come to sew up, that garter bump on this end will disappear into the seam but it will keep everything stable 
So now my next thing is, is I'm going to do this, um, put the yarn behind the needle there, take off three stitches, which is the purl in a purl wise manner, and then bring your yarn along the back and then knit across the row. And that's my form of eye cord for the front. And I will do that every row now, every other row. So at the beginning of every knit row, that's what I will be doing. So I'll have two little jobs to do. Knit to the end of the row and then knit eight for the beginning of the sleeve edge, purl across and then knit one to finish that row. Then the next row will be an I-cord row and that's how I've been doing it. Maybe that's not the way you do it or anybody else does it, but that's how I do it for this particular project. What I fancy doing when I finish this is making an I cord belt, probably using about between three and five stitches on the on a double double pointed needle. Um, I think I might use a smaller gauge needle for that, something like a three mil or three point two five. In, an, in my book sat in a number 11 and a number 10. That's what I grew up on. So you just, you remember, you know, it's kind of these metric measurements are things that have come in during my lifetime. Metric came into existence when I was in primary school. Was it primary school? It was in the 70s. Was it 1971? So by then, I'd already been knitting by then. I was 10, 11 years old and I'd been knitting already started knitting. That when I knitted a pair of bright green mittens in class. We made um we had a um, class where we learnt to knit. <laughs> but my grandma taught me to knit. Well the basics. She just taught me how to cast on, do a knit row do a pearl row and then I basically said let me get on with it and I did. I had a bit of a break from it but I remember being sat in you know a free period when you're studying for your exams well needlecraft was on my exams but I was uh, sat in an English class which was one of my top subjects on a free period, knitting. It said you could do what you liked in a free period. So I did some knitting. The headmaster was in the in that room that day. He wasn't too pleased. So I had to stop. A free period to him was reading. Or swatting up on your English. But like I said, I was taking needlecraft in my CSEs. I think that ca that counts as, as good work, does it not? I came away with good grades for English anyway, so 
in my school, we didn't have O-levels as such. If you wanted to do an O-level or a GCE, as they were then, you had to pay for them. We were in a secondary modern school and you had to pay for it. So in order to get a um, GCE for English, and I tried to get a GCE for French as well, but in order to get those, you had to pay for them. Well, we couldn't afford to pay for that. And it was at that time, oh, I forgot to do me my uh, I called bit. It was at that time that I'd had some work experience in a hairdresser's. And they were pleased with what I did. The problem was with hairdressing and at the time was it, you just, as an apprentice, you just did not get enough money. So, but, and it wasn't something I was going to make as a career. Anyway. So, I went to work for a couple of weeks before Christmas to sweep up the help sweeping up the the salon between cuts etc making teas and coffees obviously and taking out the rollers and generally chatting with the staff and I earned about was it about seven pound or more not an awful lot and um, that paid for both my GCE exams, the English and the French. Didn't do also very well with the French, although I liked French. It's not as if I was, but my nerves got me with exams. Always got my got me with my nerves. But. <sighs> I did well with the English, both in the CSEs and the GCE. One of my best subjects. I loved writing stories at the time. I wrote poetry as well, around about that time. Which I've kept to this day. I'll have to read you some of my poetry one day. So yeah, so we're trundling along. Somebody asked me why I call my podcast or why I call my, uh, why I call it Saoirse and Lilac. Um, there's the long story and there's the short story. I'm still debating whether I should leave the long story to another time. Well, my name, my first two names are Claire Lydia. In the Scottish Gaelic, which I, uh, a friend of mine found when we moved to the Outer Hebrides, he, wanted, he was into the Scottish Gaelic himself and he wanted to find out what our names were in the language. So my name, Claire, means light and bright. And the word for light and bright in the Scottish Gaelic is Sorica, 
S-O-R-C-H-A. Now, there are some, there is a famous actress on Father Brown, the Father Brown series. I can't think of the character she plays, but she's the little Irish housekeeper. And she, her real, her name in real life is Saoirse Cusack. Now she spells that S-O-R-C-H-A. So it's either Sorica or Saoirse. I have a little bit of the Irish blood in me going back a few generations. So I thought, well, I live in Scotland. So I can sort of, I can still use it. So I use it, you can either say whatever you like, to be honest. <laughs> Everybody's going to um, pronounce it differently or pronounce it as it's spelled. But I usually say Saoirse and Lilac. Now, the interesting thing about lilac is that it's an unusual name, but I coined it many years ago, in fact, 17 years ago. Um, when I thought I was pregnant and I was going to have, I was convinced I was going to have a little girl because my middle name is Lydia and Lydia is a Bible name. And the character Lydia was a seller of purple. It's Greek, it's a Greek name. And I was named after a Greek lady that my parents knew. So the, so therefore, When I, when I tell people that Lydia means purple, it's never normally sort of, people don't normally know that, but lilac is a shade of purple from a very pale shade. And if you see the plants, they can go from pale to dark. So you can, you know, you can quite happily use that. In Persian, the name is Lilias, which is nice. Um, I'm sure many languages have their own version of the name Lilac. So I'd been calling myself Clary Fairy for quite some time. And I was thinking well, that's a bit childish, really, but I quite liked it. It was a bit cute cutesy. I still use it as my design handle, Clary Fairy, in various places. But as time's gone on, I've changed it to Saoirse and Lilac. More of a branding than anything. And I have two little girlies. I'm going to put a picture up of them up above who represent my saucer and lilac. But if you look at my logo, I'll put a picture up of that. The little logo looks like a heart. Well, that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to be about love, isn't it? Heart. But the heart is made up 
the red part of a mum and the lilac part for a little baby. We're getting up this sleeve. This sleeve has got to be six inches before I start shaping the shoulder. And what I've done with the sh shoulder shaping is done a, sh a short row system. Did that on the other side. There, I think you can just about see that. So it kind of curves down a bit, just slightly. It's very slight, you can hardly see it. But that's where the short rows are, there and there and there. And the other short row is up here where the sleeve will sleeve will be joined like at the shoulders i have got the other piece i'm on the second piece now that's the full the full one can you see that all right shall i bring it in uh, shall we test shall we test the focus we yeah. There. And I'm just, just, just one minute. Just one minute, I want to show you something. Let me stay With your arms around me If we stay here like this is the only 